Good morning, everyone. Thank you for dialing in. Um, we were just waiting a few minutes to make sure that everyone who'd signed up was able to, to join. I'll just start my video so you can see me who's talking. I'm Sophia. I'm the um, campaigns director at the IAB. Um, and it's my pleasure today to host uh, the event around working towards equality in an unprecedented time, a word that's been much overused, I think, um, unfortunately. And actually, this, this event was planned at the end of last year to be today. Um, obviously, it's an event in person, but um, in, in, I think it was in April, we felt we needed to reframe the focus around what was COVID and the challenge that we're dealing with there and why equality is so important. Obviously, this title now has almost another meaning given what's been going on in the last couple of weeks. So it feels really relevant and we've got some really um, fantastic speakers uh, to share with you today and some great content. So uh, we will crack on and share with you what we are going to cover. So one thing I thought would be worth um, highlighting, I'm not going to delve into the whole topic, but, but McKinsey Quarterly um, released their most recent um, report, Diversity Still Matters, in May. So this is prior to the, the events of recent weeks, which really focused on the fact that um, inclusion and diversity are definitely a high potential for risk during this crisis. They looked at crises of previous um, years and decades and, and realised that these sorts of um, topics or in, um, initiatives can really be underrepresented. They can go down the sort of priority list simply because businesses need to focus on um, the very critical um, issues of managing people, of managing projects, of, of, of ensuring employment, of, of ensuring that companies stay afloat, which is obviously a real, real shame. Um, but they point out very clearly that business recovery and resilience is incredibly uh, reliant on having diverse um, workforces, that actually the reimagination and the working differently that we'll need to do on the other side of this is absolutely beholden to having a more diverse uh, group of people with different perspectives and different views. So whilst that unintentional um, reduction in focus on inclusion and diversity can happen, um, it's actually the most important thing a business can do to thrive after um, the situation that we're currently in. Um, to get that innovation and so on. So I think that's just a really nice way of sort of couching today's event um, as, as well as some of the topics we're going to, to talk about today. So um, I just want to mention a big thank you to Unruly who are our sponsors for the uh, webinar today. Um, thank you for your continued support and we're looking forward to hearing from you some fantastic research you've done, um, which um, Rebecca will be kicking off very shortly. Um, if you haven't uh, absorbed the agenda, it's pretty rich. We've got, um, as I say, Rebecca from Unruly talking about gender stereotypes in online advertising. We have Ali Hanan, Creative Equals, uh, talking about the um, importance and criticalness of um, inclusion in business. Ewan McPherson from Havas Media Group will be talking about the riding the Corona coaster, which is just brilliant um, and something we've probably all done over recent weeks. Miriam Faber from Facebook will be talking about supporting diverse communities. We have Matt Jordan from M6 looking at neurodiversity and the impact that um, the lockdown and isolation and working differently has had on people who aren't neurodiverse and their needs uh, during this time. And um, to close, we have Sume Thompson, who is um, CEO of Media Trust. Media Trust is our uh, charity partner, and she'll be talking about the tipping point for inequality and whether COVID has proved to be to be just that. We'll also have questions at the end. If you have any during the speaking sessions, please just pop them into the Q&A function on Zoom so you can type them in. We'll review them at the end and we'll, we'll um, facilitate those questions at the end to each speaker. Um, just so that you don't think that there are only words, there are also people and pictures. You'll obviously see each speaker as they talk, but I thought it was nice to show everybody um, up front. So we look forward to hearing from you all. Um, and I will now hand over to Rebecca Waring, um, VP of Insight at Unruly, who will be talking about the research for gender stereotypes. Welcome to Rebecca. We would have a virtual round of applause now were we in the room. Okay, hi everyone. Hopefully you can hear me and see me and see my slides. So I'm Becky Waring from Unruly. 
Um, we're a video advertising platform. We're also really well known for our research into emotion in advertising and um, our testing and targeting approach, which is all about emotions and understanding of an empathy for the consumer. So this research I'm about to show you is about gender stereotypes in advertising. Um, we wanted to get the consumer perspective on this and ultimately we want to prove the business case for more progressive um, gender portrayal. Okay, so how we do this, the unstereotyped question is something that we include in all of our video testing. So it doesn't just cover gender, but a whole range of different characteristics. And in much the same way that we ask respondents about, so this is how we ask them to rate their emotional response to the video. We'll ask them to rate it on an intensity scale from one to 10. So we do the same, same thing for stereotypes, asking them to rate it where a 10 would be a highly authentic and positive portrayal and a one would be really stereotypical, lazy or demeaning. And you can see at the bottom there, we've kind of bucketed it into negative, neutral and positive when we report the results. And for this particular study, we specially selected ads, um, about 40 ads from the US and UK, and we split them into two groups, progressive versus stereotypical. Um, how we selected them, the progressive ones were ads which directly addressed the topic of gender and, um, or they maybe subverted traditional gender roles that you would normally see in advertising in some way. Then the stereotypical ones are either ads which have attracted a consumer backlash for being stereotypical or they have in fact been banned by um, bodies such as the ASA. So for each of those ads we would ask the unstereotyped question and then we cross-reference it with our standard unruly EQ metrics um, which cover emotional responses and brand metrics. The top line finding is that nine out of the top 10 ads when we ranked them by our EQ score were progressive ads. So the EQ score, um, it covers emotional response, but it also takes into account an improvement in brand favorability and purchase intent. So the EQ score is designed to be quite holistic and, and look at the overall performance of the ad. So this is great because this is a clear sign that progressive ads have a better overall performance. So today I was just going to focus on um, a deep dive into the UK ads that we tested. So we've got some examples of the best and worst performing on that unstereotyped question and also looking at how being progressive or stereotypical affected the various metrics that we track. So the first finding is that progressive ads were more emotive than stereotypical ads and they were much more emotive than the UK norm as well. Um, this, the data I'm showing here is for the general population, however, it, this is particularly pronounced in female audiences and also in the youngest age group, 18 to 24s, that we survey. The key emotions that these ads evoke are inspiration, happiness, warmth and pride. And they do this in a few ways. So we would notice a lot of ads that evoke warmth and happiness. The ads that tend to do that the best often focus on um, actually children and babies as a way to show human equality and human potential in a really approachable way. And that's how, that's how we saw a lot of ads um, successfully evoked happiness and warmth. And then inspiration and pride, tend, those tend to come more from ads which are directly addressing the topic of gender and explicitly reversing gender stereotypes. Um, I also wanted to look at the emotions evoked by stereotypical ads. So interestingly, we found they were more likely to be funny, just, just slightly. Um, but at the same time, they were more likely to evoke contempt and disgust. So when we looked into the ads that were driving these types of responses, some of them were using stereotypes as a source of humour. And so actually, for some people, that was funny and relatable, whereas for others, they find it quite isolating. And hence, you get this polarised response. 
what was really interesting about these um, these findings for stereotypical ads is that it lines up really nicely with this research we did with the IPA last year into driving long-term and short-term business and brand outcomes. We found that for short-term activation effects, actually things like hilarity, contempt and disgust were quite highly correlated. So I thought this actually went really nicely in line with an example from the US, Peloton. So they got quite a backlash for their ad, which was seen as stereotypical. But actually, it was found that they did have quite a good increase in subscribers after airing that ad and all the noise around it. Um, but of course, in the IPA findings, we also found that ads which evoke a positive emotional response tend to work better over the long term to drive brand metrics. So going for this kind of approach can work well for a short term attention and sales spikes, but um, over the long term, the positive emotional response is more effective. Now going on to brand metrics. So progressive ads are more likely to drive an increase in brand favorability. And in the same way, stereotypical ads, there's a higher risk of having a decrease in brand favorability. So when we looked at the other kind of metrics that were related to this, we found that there were certain brand values which were driven really effectively by progressive ads. So things like empowering, trustworthy, relatable. Um, and in fact, I think all positive brand associations were more likely to go along with a progressive ad, apart from one which was relevant, which I found really interesting. So stereotypical ads were more likely to be seen as relevant um, and what we found is that sometimes it's because they're taking a more product focused approach, in which case there's a directly relevant sales message for people. But the other one is quite often they're playing on stereotypes. So some of those stereotypes, a bit like we saw with the humour, people do find relevant to them. And then on the other hand, some of the ads we are testing on the progressive group were explicitly targeted towards women, in which case naturally they, they were felt less relevant by men. Now for purchase consideration, for the general population, there isn't such a big difference between the two groups. And as I mentioned, a lot of the stereotypical ads had a more, um, more clear sales message, and that's probably part of what's driving this. However, for females and 18 to 24 year olds, we did find that there was a very big difference. And then one of the interesting things in this section was I think around brands broadening out their audience slightly. So we noticed in some cases, say for example, the parenting ad that includes men as well as women in parenting roles, we found that that would drive greater purchase intent among the males in the audience, but also among the females. Or for example, in this, actually the image we have here from the ice cream ad, this obviously is showing a more diverse age range than before, and that resonated well with all age groups but actually especially with the youngest age group so i think there is there's a point here about broadening out the audience that you're speaking to with your ads to drive higher purchase intents and the final stat we're looking at is memorability so recall progressive ads were more memorable than stereotypical ads as well and i think there's two reasons for this so one of them is that the progressive ads obviously stand out from your typical ad because they are subverting the traditional roles that you would see in those ads. Um, and that makes them more distinctive. And on the other hand, we do tend to find that in when people are watching an ad that they're like, this is just, you know, this is just a typical ad, the same old cliches, they tend to switch off a lot sooner as well. So they're not paying so much attention by the time you get to the end of the ad, which is where the brand reveal or brand message tends to be, they might not be listening anymore. And then another factor which I think drives this is to do with how well integrated the brand is. So the progressive ads in general, obviously, if people have decided to make a progressive message, they put a bit more care into how they how they're talking to people just by the fact that they're doing that and we see we've seen the same level of care in the way they integrate their brand so it's done in a more skillful way 
um, whereas some of the stereotypical ads were quite lazy, not just in their stereotypes, but in the way they branded the ads. So, for example, just sticking a logo on the end. So that's how gender stereotypes relate to some of the key metrics in the study. And then I've got some examples of videos from the study which did either particularly poorly or particularly well on the unstereotype metric. So if we start um, from the bottom, PC Specialist, one of the latest ads to be banned by the ASA. So it contravened gender stereotype rules because it, showed, it was suggesting that only males could be experts at using computers. So the EQ score here is 4.1 out of 10, which is I think the lowest score in the study, the average is five. 24% of people said it was a negative portrayal of gender. And as you can see, the top psychological responses we're tracking there along with the index number, confusion, surprise, and knowledge. Um, having very high confusion like that's really not a good thing. So I'll play the ad in a second, but a lot of people said they felt excluded by it and everyone picked up on the gender thing. Although there were some quite a few comments as well, noting that it had good representation in terms of ethnicity. So they'd done well on one count, but not on the other, unfortunately. And the people who were most turned off by it were actually young males, 18, 24. So presumably the very people that PC specialists were trying to target. It. It's the beginning of the end, the end of following. It's the start of freedom, individuality, choice. It's an uprising, an insurgence for the players, the gamers, the I'll sleep laters, the creators, the editors, the music makers, the techies, the coders, the illustrators. Bespoke, customized, like no other. From the specialists, for the specialists. PC Specialist. And now this next one is really well known. Philadelphia's New Dads video. This was also banned um, for the stereotype that men were inept fathers and that only women um, are able to properly take care of children. I've actually, interestingly, I've seen this again on TV recently where they've cut off, um, they've cut off certain parts of it. So the ad is still airing, but they've removed the, the stereotypical elements. I think this one, actually, there were some interesting findings on this one as well, because a lot of people picked up on the stereotype about parenting. However, we did have a few people comment as well that they thought it was positive that the ad was showing new fathers and it was showing men looking after children even though they're not shown doing it very well. And I think, I'm sure that was originally the brand's intention. So there was a little bit of polarization here. And we also, this one wasn't completely negative because although some people were offended by it, others said, okay, this is, this is kind of offensive, but I also find it funny and I think it's true to life. So this one had a bit of a mixed response. <laughs> New Dad 2. Mm -hmm. Wow, look at this lunch. Yeah, hard to choose. Oh, this looks good. Mm -hmm. That's really good. Well, that's the Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let's not tell them. Okay, and now we've got a couple of the ones which scored the highest. So, Renault's 30 years. This had a really strong score for the gender portrayal. So, 51% said it was positive. Um, however, the EQ score overall was only just above average. And the reason for that is this, it didn't perform very well on brand metrics. So it was highly emotive. And so it focuses on a romantic relationship between two women, which is really unusual in advertising, I think, and especially the autos category. So a lot of the positive comments came from the fact that people thought this was really, it, they thought it was quite realistic and like not overly glamorized and actually, this one scored really well for social class as well, for being a realistic representation of social class. So it was highly emotive. However, a large number of viewers picked up on the fact that they were questioning what this had to do with Renault. And they were saying that the link to the brand was really tenuous. And that actually, in fact, it kind of damaged some people's perception of the brand. And 
because it, they thought it wasn't credible. So I thought that was. Come on, puppet. <laughs> you gotta do I don't believe that anybody feels the way I do about you now Backbeat The word is on the street that the fire in your heart is out from SIF. So this is a video which done, it's done amazingly all around. Score of 7.1 in EQ, which is pretty much as high as you can get. And 53% thought it was a positive portrayal of gender. And as you can see in the top psychological responses, there's no confusion. It's all just positive emotion there that's all indexing way above the norm. So this video is so interesting because it's a cleaning product video but it's taken it out of the stereotypical setting so in in various ways so it's not showing a housewife using the products it's not showing a kind of unrealistic perfect home and another interesting thing is it's focused on community whereas quite often cleaning products are focusing on looking after your immediate family so it's just really different in so many ways um, and it's, it spoke to a very, very large number of the audience. A lot of people use the tunnel to get from one side of Corsair to the other, if they're going to play football in the recreation ground, if they're going to school, it's a really vital part of accessing one part of the town from the other. It's been in a real state since Christmas time when there was a fire in the tunnel. It's just felt like everything has really got dark and gloomy and people feel quite nervous about going through there. I certainly don't walk through there on my own at night time. I would sooner walk all the way round than walk through here. I feel like the tunnel is quite small and really intimidating when you walk through it. The idea is to try and bring the community together to, to sort of help make it a better place for everybody. At the moment it's looking really dirty, unwelcoming and not very safe. So we're just cleaning it up, making it a happier, brighter place for all of the people who live and work here. really nice. I definitely want to walk through it. If our environment looks nice, we're more likely to keep it clean, we're more likely to be happy. It's colourful, it's clean. Now more people will access the park. That's what generates happiness. And the project has really helped the whole health and well-being of the local population. Yeah, you 
it's, it's unright, it's beautiful, it's, it's a work of art. More people will use it now, certainly, because it's it's brighter and it's it's cheerful. It's never looked as good as it has now. You couldn't go through there and not smile. Something like this, which is going to be so visible and is used by so many people, is going to make a huge difference. Okay, so to wrap up, um, emotions key. I mean, we always say that at Unruly, but it, you remember to focus on emotional response first. So having a progressive gender message isn't a silver bullet at all. It has to be, it has to go together with really understanding your consumer and making that emotional connection with them. And actually, on the other hand, with um, stereotypical ads, it can be done in a way that does resonate with people and isn't offensive if the execution is right. Um, the next point is remember to integrate your brand. So a bit like we saw with that Renault example, people can appreciate a beautiful story and positive message. However, they are very, very quick to notice if, you're, if, it, if the link to the brand is tenuous. So you have to make sure that your brand is credible and is kind of is playing a, an integrated role in the video. And finally, we tended to find a pattern that ads which were just relatable and inclusive, and so they are just naturally incorporating diversity as part of the story, as opposed to a more explicit message about gender, tend to have better overall performance. So that's something interesting to bear in mind. It's like just having a broader cast and having an inclusive message is what we find has, tends to resonate the best with UK consumers. Lovely. Thank you, Rebecca. Sorry, I was just uh, sharing. Am I sharing my screen? I think I am. That was great. It was great to see some creative um, to kick off the day. And we've already got a question for you in the Q&A function, which we'll come to at the end because I'm conscious of time. But thank you so much. And if anyone has any questions um, on that, please do pop them in the Q&A function at the bottom. We will be moving on now to Ali. Ali Hanan, um, founder of and CEO of Creative Equals, talking about why inclusion is business critical. Can I hand over to you, Ali? Hey, I'm trying to start my video, but it says that the uh, the host has stopped it. Okay. Okay. Got to log in, yeah. Yeah, I'm here. Right. Good morning, everybody. I haven't prepared a massive deck, um, and I'm just going to speak freely and from the heart today because it has been a massive. Uh, three, four weeks for our team. And I think I'm just gonna tell you a little bit of a story about the last four weeks. And I guess for us, the only thing that we should be talking about right now is the Black Lives Matter movement and also how that has a direct impact on our industry. Um, I'm gonna ask you to take off the slide actually so that you can all just see my face on the screen. Otherwise you're gonna be looking at the holding slide for the next 15 uh, minutes if that's at all uh, possible and if we could just move that to a speaker view that would be fantastic. So I guess the story that I'm about to tell you it actually starts centuries ago. It starts with the slave movement back in 1614. It whips through history, through centuries, through dec decades into um, the world of uh, Edward Colston, into the world of the Windrush scandal and throughout time and I think this pivotal moment in history has been coming for a long, long time and it has arrived in a massive way. And I think it has, and it particularly arrived on the 25th of May when two incidents happened. The first one was a woman, uh, involved a woman called Amy Cooper. Um, she was uh, walking her dog in the Rambles, which is a bird watching area in the States. And she didn't have her dog on a leash um, and a, a man came up to her, his name was Chris Cooper, um, he was a black man, and he asked her to put her dog on a leash. And in that moment, she weaponized her white privilege. Uh, she called the police and she called the police on the man uh, and she said, called the police and said, an African-American man 
as threatening my life. And by doing that, she was threatening his. And on the same day, there was the tragic and intentional death of George Floyd. I'm sure you've all watched the video. It is the most harrow harrowing, horrific video where we watch a police officer putting his knee on the neck of a black man for up to nine minutes. And we hear him saying things, George Floyd saying things like, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And in that moment, the world exploded. In that moment, the, the Black Lives Matter movement uh, was reignited. It's been a movement that's been around for a long time. And I think we've seen that movement absolutely, you know, take hold across the globe um, and into, you know, our every country and into our culture and into our, our, our own businesses. Um, and that was all happened on the 25th of May. And then actually what happened with, for us is over that weekend, I woke up in the morning on a Saturday to a WhatsApp between a couple of um, people I know and love, a guy called Michael Brown, um, who uh, works for UM. He is the uh, insights partner there and the culture director and our own partnerships director, uh, an amazing woman called Stephanie Matthews. And they had this idea of, we need to do something. We need to be able to, you know, corral the industry at this point in time. We need to take a stand on this. We need to show up and be seen as a sector. We need an open letter. And in that moment, uh, Michael went off and wrote the first draft of the letter. And we realized pretty quickly that we needed to get lots of different eyeballs on the letter. We need to, to make sure that the language was right and that there, our asks were deep and uh, meaningful and we're going to you know, um, uh, enact uh, transformational change. Uh, so over the course of the weekend, we had lots of contributors to the letter. We had um, uh, Heidi Gardner, the Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer of IPG Contribute, Lydia Amois, our Learning and Cross-Cultural Director, Ete Davis, the CEO of the, of the Engine Group and the founder of Culture Heroes. We had Leah Fatah from uh, Platform uh, 13. If you don't know Media for, for All, you should go and check them out, but we had the whole media for all uh, crew contributing, uh, particularly the work of Mimi Turner and Dino uh, Myers-Lampty, uh, founder of The Barbershop. And then actually what happened uh, uh, was the uh, letter then the following day went through, you know, uh, almost, <laughs> I'm a copywriter, right? So actually what was, uh, you know, challenging was like it went through so many iterations, words were really fought over and, you know, argued over and debated. And we, in the end, we ended up with, with a, a, a draft version that we wanted to uh, put out into the world and see if we could get some signatories. Um, a lady called Sabrina from uh, Niche On Demand contributed. And then actually when we put the letter out to a global audience, we had Kai Lawson, Director of Community for WPP, and, and a woman uh, who lives out of New York, uh, Laura Migno, uh, the founder of DFlash, really all contributing to create a global version of uh, this letter. And in the first day, there was sort of like a put, putting it out into the world, putting the draft out there, still getting continuous feedback on it. It again went through another round of amends and iterations. But then with the signatories started coming in and the signatories started coming in thick and fast. And to be honest, we were never, ever going to go out with the letter until we had um, Karen Blackett, OBE, uh, country manager for WPP, as one of the core and key signatories. And then the amazing thing is all the bodies signed up. So John Muse, head of the IAB, was one of the first uh, body signatories. Paul Bainsfair from the IPA, Stephen Woodford from the Advertising Association, Phil Smith from the uh, from ISBA, um, Steve Davis from the Advertising Producers Association, all the bodies uh, signed up. And then Fast forward to this week, we've now had something like 550 signatories and some from the biggest companies uh, on the planet from Google, Snapchat, Pinterest, Channel 4, ITV. And the letter has become and taken on a life of its own. And so I wanted to just stop and really get you all to just really listen to the content um, and to really think about it, obviously in terms of the you know, social context that is going on, but also thinking about it in terms of our own businesses and the systemic racism that we have failed to address as a sector 
and you know that ur that needs urgent uh, attention and a long-lasting commitment to change. So I'm going to just stop and read a little bit of the of the letter. Um, as a creative sector, the fact is what we do and who we represent has a profound impact on culture, and yet systematic inequality continues in our industry. I don't know if you've seen the IPA figures, but the figures that were published in April 2020 confirmed that marginal gains have been made in diversifying the ethnic makeup of leadership. We have actually gone backwards. I'm just going to pause there because we have actually gone backwards in terms of ethnic represent, re representation. Only 4.7% of executives uh, have, were, were, report, were, were recorded as being Black Asian minority ethnic in, uh, in 2020, compared to 5.5% in 2019. So as a sector, it has never been more important to show up as an industry and face up to our own challenges as leaders. We need to drive equity in our organizations, the people we hire, the work we produce, and how we engage with our clients. The advertising industry needs to create and maintain inclusive cultures sensitive to the inequity and the pain of racism. We ask people across the industry to be conscious of the trauma that many black colleagues and their peers may be experiencing as they process the news and the fallout of the killing of George Floyd and other acts of violence. We call on those in positions of influence to harness the cultural power of advertising and to bring authentic prominence to the crisis of racial injustice. It is not the responsibility of our black colleagues to address this imbalance or educate us on the inequities of racism that our industry has created. As inequality is so ingrained within the fabric of society and our sector, this is a problem we need to take action on to, together to really affect change. We can all self-educate. We can all challenge our prejudices and those of others. We are all able to prioritize diversity, equity, equality, and inclusion at this critical juncture in history. And so the 10 things that we have asked people to sign up and do is to call out, number one, call out and confront racism whenever it is encountered. Everybody is responsible for this from the CEO to every person across your organization. And CEO, CEOs need to acknowledge in town halls the escalating racism of the last month in order to really open up and drive this conversation in their organizations. And also just to share links and resources and to really you know, kick off those conversations that we really desperately need to have. Um, the, the accountability for change has to rest with the leaders of the sector. That's it. It's a leadership challenge. Uh, and we need to make all leaders and boards accountable for driving representation and inclusivity by making this a core part of their leadership priorities. And this is not just something that sits with HR, the HR team or the diversity and inclusion board. We always believe at Creative Equals that uh, diversity and inclusion should be held by and by every single person within the organization. I should be able to go up to anybody in your organization and say, what does diversity, inclusion, and equality mean here? And you should be able to tell me what it means for you personally, but also what it means for you in your role, whether you're a strategist or a researcher or whatever role that you do, you should think about how it you know, shows up for your job, for the work, for the business opportunities that uh, you create, for the way that you reflect and, and, and resonate with your audiences. So we believe that actually one of the key things is, you know, uh, delivering uh, and, and putting forward clear KPIs um, and then deeply understanding your own data and retention figures. As with your gender pay gap, um, there will be the ethnicity pay gap on the, on, the, on the reporting horizon. So it's a good time to start really proactively looking at that. Um, the third thing is to encourage staff to understand their own privileges and specifically uh, white privilege uh, and really understand the bias and barriers that people have so that they are accountable allies and not just allies but actually um, activists within the space. Um, one thing that works and we know we're you know, holding one uh, today is to create listening circles for open and frank conversations about racism with everybody in attendance. Uh, use these to promote active advocacy, open dialogue and create uh, psychological safety for both people of colour and their allies. Uh, the key thing is also just to self-educate yourself on the issues and, you know, I think just to make sure that you're not continually asking your black colleagues all the time uh, for their point of view on this, because by doing so, you're often adding to their emotional load. 
Um, and then I think also just it's really super important to check in with people to ask them how they're feeling. You know, this has been, you know, a profound uh, and it's had a profound and, you know, a deep emotional impact on a lot of people. And I think it's, you know, one thing that all businesses should consider is, you know, offering a day off uh, to um, or to take the workload off of people at this time. And I think also your black employees should also feel safe to be able to step away. It's extremely you know, stressful time. And it's, you know, not being able to say, and people often feel like they can't say anything because they fear that it might put their jobs in, in danger. And as we know, there's a lot of, you know, uncertainty and fear at the moment around job security within the sector. So the seventh point is that trust must be created and bridges must be built. And solidarity in the work workforce also means creating safe spaces and addressing the many microaggressions. And these are subtle acts of discrimination that happen every day and to call them out. And if they are not just microaggressions, but often flat out discrimination to report these in a safe way. Um, we have to commit to accelerated action that seeks to eliminate bias in the portrayal of all people worldwide in advertising and media, um, enabled by a proportionate representation across the industry ecosystem and powered by an inclusive and engaged community. And that means also thinking about diversity and inclusion right along the supply chain. Uh, so in front of the camera, increase representation and eliminate stereotypes in all of your marketing creative, but behind the camera, set goals for hiring diverse talent in all roles and hire, fund and promote black talent. Commit to, and the 10th one is the final one, which is committing to creating an inclusive and supportive environment that treats people equally in all aspects of their career development. Examine your preferred suppliers list. And this last point comes from the Conscious Advertising Network. And you know, I think this is a real call out to all advertisers and to the IAB community is to make sure that your advertising is not inadvertently funding white supremacy or racist content. Um, so that is the letter. And like I say, it's just been amazing how it has absolutely gathered um, support, um, not just in the UK and the US, but actually across the globe. We are now having signatories come in from Mexico and Australia. Um, and this afternoon, we have a session for all CEOs and signatories on the letter with uh, Karen Blackett, with June Sapong, OBE, uh, with Xavier Rees from Havis, and uh, Alini Santos, who is the Executive VP of Marketing and Head of Diversity and Inclusion at Unilever. So you're very, very welcome to come and join us uh, uh, at that session today. And I think, you know, what we really want to do is really unpack some of these 10 points and really think about what people can do within their businesses. I really liked what you said at the beginning, Sophia, just really looking at the McKinsey report, because I think we have to think about five key points and, and why we have to really care about this, this right now. And I guess the number one thing is to think about is, you know, particularly when uh, we are in a state of uncertainty and the, the sector is, you know, currently going through a lot of restructures is to make sure that your diverse talent isn't at risk. And if you are going into a restructure to make sure that you're keeping diversity and inclusion right at the heart of your reorg and thinking about how you might want to uh, thinking, you know, really closely about the team that you're going to have left behind after that reorg, because I think, you know, in a time of a crisis, it's quite uh, natural human behavior to uh, revert to the status quo to people who sound and look like us. Uh, but we know from our inclusion pulse uh, study that actually diverse talent is particularly struggling at this time uh, and particularly um, black Asian minority ethnic talent as well as working mothers and the LGBT plus community. Um, and, you know, I think that the key thing is that there are so many things to be doing uh, and so many changes to be to be made. Um, I think just five key takeouts from the, the McKinsey study just that are, are worth uh, going over is diverse talent is at risk right now um, and that this is actually not the time to deprioritize diversity and inclusion but to keep it top of the agenda. Um, if you want to win the war for talent, making sure that that is front of your employer brand and your company messaging is business critical. 
Um, and I think, you know, just knowing that actually having all sorts of different voices and all sorts of decision makers at the table will help you improve your decision making. And I really liked a, uh, a top from a guy called, a tip from a guy called um, Tom Luby the other day, which was, you know, really, you know, if all companies can think about by the end of 2020 uh, to make sure that they have black, Asian, minority, ethnic talent, and at least two people at every decision making table, you know, just think of how, uh, you know, innovative, profitable, and creative, and uh, your business will be, uh, you know, considering that we serve, you know, so many different cons um, consumer audiences as a sector. And I think that's the fourth point from the McKinsey study is uh, by having diverse groups at the table, you're going to increase your customer satisfaction uh, and your customer insight and your potential for innovation. And the last point is that we see from diversity and inclusion is it actually improves employee motivation and satisfaction and the other critical point is in today's global market it also gives you an, a, an outward facing uh, perspective so that is uh, the letter um, I'm going to put just in the in the box um, our uh, our uh, website email address um, and uh, sorry our website address and if you'd like to sign up and become a signatory and stand behind the, the sector and all the black talent within the sector today and now, please join. Um, okay, that's it from me. Thank you so much for listening. No slides, very unrehearsed, <laughs> speaking from my truth. Um, and uh, back to you, Sophia. Thank you, Ali, that was great. And it's, it's refreshing not to have slides and to uh, listen to you. And obviously such a lot's been going on. It was a really nice way of hearing it all played back. Um, so, moving on, uh, a little bit of a delay on me regaining control. Thank you so much, Ali. So, um, moving on, we are now going to hear from Ewan McPherson, People Director Habas Media Group, about riding the corona coaster, so something a bit more um, specific to COVID and what's been going on there. Brilliant. Good morning, everybody. Thank you. That seems to have worked way too seamlessly, so that's good. I'm really happy to be here to share our wellbeing journey, so a massive thank you to the IAB for having me. Um, and I am going to share with you our wellbeing journey through the lens of how we rode the Corona Coaster, or the less snappy title of how we managed the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic with our employees to help them be at their best and do their best. I, th I thought it'd be worth setting some context to frame where we're coming from. Um, our program is called Have Us Equalize. It started in 2016 and was built around the core ethos that we wanted to equip our people with the skills to be at their best and to do their best. Um, it's worth pointing out that we introduced it as a core strategic pillar to support our people above and beyond any other reason. We wanted to create meaningful value for our people by enhancing their experience both at work and in their personal lives. And we wanted to create meaningful value for the business by enhancing and driving performance. There was also a secondary motivator at that time, back in 2016, um, in that we anticipated the need for it to support a large scale change management exercise the following year. And we wanted people to be equipped for that change and as strong as prepared as they could be. And this is obviously useful context given the situation that we were about to find ourselves in earlier this year. Um, four years on from there, we run an amazing program that's something we're really proud of and have a huge raft of activity happening on an almost daily basis. And we had big plans for this year too. So it was a bit of a blow to our program once um, the pandemic hit, um, especially because Have Us Equalize and our approach to health and wellbeing in general is something that's regularly highlighted by our people as one of the things they value the most. Um, about their experience working with us, and it consistent, consistently receives the highest feedback in all of the staff surveys. Um, and I just wanted to hover here for a second, mostly so that I can round off my presentation neatly at the end. Um, I wanna labor the point though that we did introduce our program as a core strategic pillar to support our people above and beyond any other reason. It's really important. Um, for us that we kind of reiterate that um, whenever we're talking about our program. 
And as Havas, our mission is to make a meaningful difference to the brands, the businesses, and the lives of the people we work with. Um, so it's important that we reflect that internally and we think about the experience our people have in the same way. And this is why I said we wanted to create meaningful value for them by equipping them with the skills to be at their best. Uh, but what does being at their best and doing their best actually mean? Uh, this, I suppose, is quite a traditional measure of performance that's most widely in use still, the, the, the view that knowledge plus skills plus attitude equals performance. Um, but what happens if you add energy into that equation? You can have knowledge, skills and attitudes in spades, but what happens if the energy is low or at worst zero? If you multiply something by zero, you get zero. So when we say being at their best, it's this. It's this new element of energy we're introducing into the equation. When we started to think about our journey, it was actually quite hard to put it into words. Um, we knew the focus was going to be on energy and emotion, though. And if we helped people take care of that, we could trust that the work would get done. And then a member of my team stumbled across this graph by Jo Love, a mental health advocate. Um, so big shout out to her for, uh, for, for us stealing her graph for this. And we've simplified it a little for the purpose of today, but we loved it because it articulates the experience really well for us. And it resonated within the context of our wellbeing strategy and the focus on energy particularly. So our short term aim became guiding people through the Corona coaster focusing on anchoring them back to as close to normality as possible to keep them out of the loops of overwhelm, as Joe describes them. Um, and this graph charts normal against mood, but uh, I think that's easily transposed across activity and, the, and a program as well. And, but I think throughout this, we're talking about both interchangeably, really. So for the purposes of this, we're taking that first dotted line there as the official government lockdown phase. And it was clear early on looking at what was happening across the world that we were likely heading towards a lockdown. We sort of saw it gradually creep across the, across the earth. Um, and it's an obvious place to start, I suppose, but whilst we were preparing as a business for lockdown, we were also preparing from a people perspective. And it was an anxious time for everyone, right? So we looked to initially remove as many barriers and stress points as possible. So for example, we still had a scarily large proportion of people on desktop computers. So we very quickly had to order additional stocks of laptops, got to a point because China was still in lockdown, um, that in some cases towards the end, the IT team had to be running to all of the local computer shops, buying up laptops directly themselves. Um, technology in general is tends to be one of the biggest stresses that that we always see coming through so we made sure that we had several tests leading up to lockdown to make sure everything worked for example we we switched off Wi-Fi without telling anybody a couple of times and did stress tests on our VPN network um, to make sure that it could take the numbers and thankfully we did because the first couple of times it couldn't take the numbers so that was a bit a, a bit of a sweaty moment for a lot of people um, and we also ran drop-in training sessions across the four weeks before lockdown um, on all of our remote working tools Microsoft Teams that kind of thing um, and we wanted people not to have to worry about their managers sort of riding them really during this time we knew we had everybody had enough to worry about with everything that was going on um, and we communicated a clear message from the start that we appreciated the challenges that were coming our way that we were all in this together um, and that our ask of everyone in that context was just to do their best um, and that we trusted the work would get done and we repeated that messaging regularly we also spoke with our senior managers to avoid micromanagement during this time and to flag issues centrally to discuss before taking any action directly. We just wanted to make sure that we were having a measured approach. And probably most importantly of all, we tried to empower a calm attitude across the business before lockdown. Firstly, by getting in front of it early, by giving people 
whatever level of flexibility they felt was necessary for them and their individual circumstances. As we've heard explicitly and indirectly so far this morning, the pandemic is, is not a great leveler. Um, so it was really important that we were thinking about people's individual needs. And linked to the communication point, we increased the frequency of our comms to up our presence as a business and leadership team. So how did we do it moving into the official lockdown phase? There's a consistent theme here and a bit cliched maybe, but a strong foundation of communication was absolutely key. So we doubled down on that and made sure that we over communicated um, wherever we could. So most importantly, I think we used our wellness champions to tell us what was happening on the ground. So we have a really diverse group of individuals that um, have opted in and volunteered to take on this role across the agency. And that meant we were able to connect at a really individual level that we wouldn't have otherwise been able to do. Um, we also increased the frequency of our leadership communication. So we made our live monthly all agency meeting a fortnightly video. Um, we sent two pieces of um, internal comms minimum a week to sort of top and tail the week and keep people, keep people engaged and, um, and remind people that, that we were all out there together. And we made sure that those comms became a two-way channel. So we used to do a Q&A style um, ending to our monthly meetings. So we opened up online submissions, answered each question transparently at the end of that fortnightly video. And we made sure that we were highlighting people from across the business and having them directly involved too, to share their stories and experiences. And all of this was done in the spirit of keeping people connected and perpetuating that sense of community and belonging. Um, and we, we had to make changes to what we were doing like really quickly to account for those early challenges. Um, and we had sessions specific to the moment. For example, further into our people working flexibly during the lockdown, when the schools closed, we quickly pulled together resources for parents and made virtual sessions available on how to work um, from home with kids. Um, and throughout, it was important we were catering for individual needs, um, as I mentioned a couple of times. Um, I think two of the best examples of this for me um, was enabling personalization within the program by reshaping some of our coaching sessions to, to become one-to-one -one therapeutic and psychotherapy sessions. And we increased the number of sessions of what we call um, our mental wealth sessions. So these are for, there's two versions for employees and for managers. And they're particularly focused on being aware and identifying mental ill health. So we thought that was really important given these turbulent times. And we engaged all of our mental health first aiders and sort of asked them to be more vigilant than they perhaps otherwise would have been. And I personally hate the term, but no COVID-19 presentation would be complete without a reference to the new normal. And by this point, we'd established this new version of normality. So it was important for us to maintain the stability. And in a very short period of time, we were delivering 100% of our program virtually. So what does the future look like? What, what next? Which is probably as we start to come out of lockdown and it eases is, is the most important question that everybody's thinking about and looking at. So for us looking at our journey during the pandemic, we, we know we've been really successful in riding the Corona coaster and helping our people navigate their way through lockdown with us. And the subjective self drawn graph here tells us that we've got to a normal level of delivery and we've helped our people remain stabilized through the pandemic and, and the lockdown. But as we start to come out of lockdown and look to the future, like most employers, we're questioning what normal needs to look like now. And we're exploring new models of working. And you know, we, don't, we don't want to wait for that normal line to slowly return to where it was before. So for us, it's about elevating what normal used to be and taking things to a different level. It's important we continue to do this together with our people. That's been a core tenet of our program from the very, very start. Um, we've already surveyed them specifically about our health and well-being 
um, program to understand how they think we can best support them in the future. And we've got some valuable insight from that already. And this experience has shown us that I think we should, and we definitely can rely on our community of people much more than we have before. I mentioned our wellbeing champions earlier, and I think we massively underused them as a resource in the past. So we're looking at how we can supercharge their roles going into 2021. So we can do much more with and through them as well as helping them utilize their skills so much more. One of the first things we're doing is um, we're going to combine the role of wellness champion and mental health first aider, because that I think was, was something the wellness champions could have really um, could have really done with it at this moment in time. And like everyone, we're asking ourselves some of those bigger questions. So, I mean, first and foremost, how do we continue to build a brilliant culture as we develop new models of working? How do we stay true to what has worked? More than anything, trust, compassion and shared responsibility is what has got us through to this point. And these questions and values, I mean, obviously they expand beyond the confines of our Have Us Equalize program, and they are central to our thoughts as we build this new normal um, coming out of lockdown. Um, and I don't know if anyone's seen, but Fortune recently polled the CEOs of the 2020 Fortune 500 list. And one of the things they asked them was, what was the single most important thing that, was, that the crisis had taught them? And four things came out as consistent themes amongst them. And I'd like to finish on one of these. One of the four things these CEOs learned during the crisis above everything else was the meaning of the word essential. And that really struck me in the context of our wellbeing journey. And I think it's super relevant to everything we're hearing across all of the presentations today. More often than not, I see health and wellbeing programs or diversity and inclusion programs referred to as a range from at best the right thing to do to at worst a discretionary employee benefit or a nice to have. And you know, we knew we knew it before lockdown, but I think this is com it's completely cemented it for us that our wellbeing program and all these diversity inclusion programs are unequivocally essential. Thank you very much. Thank you, you, and that was great. And it's good to hear the journey that you guys have been on. And, and I think a lot of us can, can connect with uh, some of the aspects from our own um, experience. So thank you. Um, and really interesting about Forbes. We are now moving on to our next speaker, which is Miriam Faber um, from Facebook, who'll be talking about supporting diverse communities. If I can hand over to you, Miriam. Hello. I'm going to share my screen with you. Thank you. Fab. Okay. So at Facebook, our company mission has always been to give people the power to build community and bring the world closer together. And I guess never true, no, never, never sooner has that kind of been more important, obviously, with all the things that we've been seeing going on in the world right now. And I'm incredibly lucky that as my role as content and campaigns lead at Facebook is I get a lot of autonomy to be able to build out campaigns that will actually address things like diversity and inclusion. And the other part of my role, which is kind of more an internal role, is I'm also one of the co-leads for our Pride at FBRG. It's a resource group internally for people who want to lean into LGBTQ issues and just find a community to actually talk to, which I find amazing value in doing. <clears throat> But today I'm going to focus on three main areas. That's community, allyship, and also purpose. So, you know, we've heard the word many, many times now, you know, we are in absolutely unprecedented times, the global pandemic, but also now with all the societal issues going on around diversity and also racism. So, but I think never before have people really wanted to connect as much, you know, and build that community and feel that sense of belonging. But unfortunately, this has actually now had to happen virtually, which causes a lot of problems, but also a lot of opportunity. Our research has shown that people feel a lot more happy, healthier and confident when they're part of a community. And I think probably since COVID, there have been over one million new community groups that have started across Facebook just around COVID. So people wanting to support people who have been affected and people wanting to offer help. And we've got a whole hub of resources to help people do that with. 
But I think one of the biggest things that people have been seeing is the impact this has had on small businesses. So actually my wife had her own small business, which unfortunately had to close down, it was in catering. So terrible time to be a small business. But you know, we're actually as a platform doing lots of things now to try and pivot and help people re-emerge from COVID, sort of rebuild their businesses. And one of the things that we've done in terms of accelerating that is one of our products, which is around gift cards. And I don't know if anyone's seen those gift cards, but they're on Facebook and both Instagram. And it actually means now that you can almost like prepay or pay a business for their um, items, whatever that might be, or their services, almost like prepay, which help, helps them with cash flow, which is essential, obviously, for any small business. <clears throat> obviously, we also have a lot more of the fun things as well on our platforms, such as stickers and polls and things like that. But again, pivoting much more towards small businesses. I don't know if anyone's seen those help a small business sticker, which you can do. I and mean, you can actually tag a small business that you might know. So whether it be a coffee shop or a sweet shop or whatever it might be, and actually helping build that community back up around a small business. You know, you might end up tagging someone that someone else might not have known about them and you can help drive the economy in that way too, which is amazing and a huge priority for us as well. The second thing that I want to talk about is allyship. And I know I think pretty much every presentation, rightly so, will talk about allyship today in some form or other. So an ally is a person who stands up and offers, other per and offers inclusion to other people. And it's a verb, it's very much an active word about doing something. So rather than sitting back and hoping that you'll you know, taught the lessons, it is about activity and doing something. <clears throat> I think what's incredibly important here is having the right team in place and having the right allies to drive better briefs, drive better creative ideas, better executions, and ultimately better results. So I think what I'd like you all to do, which might be a bit strange because I know we're all kind of virtual, is put up your hand if you've ever done a Ramadan campaign. Obviously I can't see you so I have no idea if people have done a Ramadan campaign or not. But I would like to think that probably most people have thought about it but might not have actually done it. And I'll be honest, you know, it's the first time in the UK that we've actually done a Ramadan campaign. <clears throat> I think when it comes to this, it's something that I think the UK still seems as like a bit of a cultural cousin to Christmas or say Easter, which people were very comfortable around. And I think it's a hugely missed opportunity. You know, you've got this entirely massive community. Over, over a quarter of the world's population is in fact Muslim, which is an outstanding fact. Four million people in the UK alone are Muslims. But it's this idea for brands, and I think that, you know, this cultural moments are almost untouchable because perhaps you don't have the right team in place you don't have the right allies in place and i think if anything you know the black lives matter movement has shown us recently is not understanding it's probably not a good enough reason anymore not to have a go and not to try so i think it's really important to open up our eyes and think about how to possibly do something differently so one of the things that i'd like to um talk about is kind of you know how we came about doing our ramadan campaign so for example, on the slide you can see in front of you, I think there are, I have to count again now, but I think there are nine creators in total. So we actually used two other creators who are not in this photograph. There's a lady called Basma Khalifa, who's probably quite a well-known director and script writer, and also a young photographer called Mabdul, if you can look him up, at Mabdul. We knew that we didn't have all the answers at Facebook, and we certainly didn't necessarily know how to portray Ramadan in an authentic way for the UK audience. It was very, very different, obviously, to you know, much more progressive Eastern culture, which celebrates Ramadan almost as part of the tapestry of life every day. So we worked with Basma and Mose, our extended kind of team, to say, look, we want to understand the conversations that are happening amongst this community. What do they need? What do they want brands to know about Ramadan? And how can we turn up authentically? Essentially, it was going back to my first point, which is, Let's use the community, be true allies, and use them to actually tell the stories that need to be told. So I'm not going to name everybody in this picture, but in here you've got someone who is, you know, the face of Burberry, someone who consults for Mac, a BBC presenter, a professional athlete. So all these different perspectives of people that are coming together, and it's that community around being Muslim that brought them together. And you can watch all the great content, it's amazing, but I don't think that we would have ever got to this kind of creative and this modern look and feel if someone had said, let's build out a Ramadan campaign. Because I think it would have been quite scary for people to kind of get their head around, you know, what should we do? What should we talk about? The other example I want to talk about is another campaign we did. Actually, I think it was about a week before lockdown, we actually had this event, I think the 26th of February, which was called Meet the Family. 
Now, you might wonder, why did we do something around Meet the Family? But there is something around 2.5 million communities, parenting communities specifically, on our Facebook platforms alone, which is a massive, massive opportunity, obviously, for people to engage with this, you know, this, um, this group of people from understanding what they need, what they don't need, who's driving those conversations, what are those conversations? So again, we kind of took some of these learnings around, you know, working directly and opening up our own network. You can imagine, obviously, you know, Facebook and Instagram, we've got tons and tons of resources, but actually what better to do than use our own platforms to find those conversations and help drive those conversations with people who are doing them day to day authentically. <clears throat> So we actually approached a few creators and some of them might be well known. I mean, I only found out who some of these people are after I had my own child 18 months ago, but they're huge. We've got the likes of Louise Pentland, Candice Braithwaite, um, Mother Pucker, you might know her, Anna Whitehouse, Tom Cox, quite a few people. But again, making sure that we had fair representation from all different facets of life, whether that was socioeconomic, gender, um, ethnicity, all sorts of stuff. But trying to build out a well-rounded picture, accepting that we didn't necessarily have all the answers ourselves, but using our community and showing up as allies to actually build it out ourselves. So what did we actually achieve? You'll see sort of on the left-hand side of the screen, we sort of actually did a European-wide, I guess like a Northern European-wide sort of uh, campaign. So we had a Swedish, a Danish, a UK, and an Instagram um, version of a report which gave people new insights into parenting across our platforms how to reach them but perspectives from our creators saying you might think that parents want to know about this thing over here but the real thing to talk about is that over there which was amazing for us you know and it might sound really obvious about using you know the audience talk about the audience but using creators for us was just incredibly powerful because they live this day in day out and i think again accepting that you might not know all the answers and your business might not know all the answers but find the people that do and collaborate with them authentically and we gave them the platform literally through the whole campaign. They helped us design the ads, they helped us write the report, and they turned up at the event on the day as well. So using them authentically, not just kind of showing up for one part and then walking away. It really was the platform was theirs to, to learn from. And the third thing I'm going to talk about is purpose, which is a huge word, I know. Um, I don't know if I could do much justice in this kind of last few minutes, but I think it's such a powerful and important word specifically now as well. Um, and I guess as it's Pride Month, it seemed kind of apt for me to be able to maybe talk about a specific thing around pride and how you can have purpose around pride um, and LGBTQ matters. So given obviously since COVID, a lot of the parades and big you know, carnivals and things that have been happening around the world can't happen in person because of social distancing and all sorts of things. For the first time, obviously, a lot of these you know, big celebrations and charities and brands and fundraisers need to actually transform their activations on our own platforms. And not just ours, obviously, you've got YouTube and Twitter and TikTok, all the others, you know, we're not, we're not exclusive. Um, but one thing to know that we, we kind of learned very quickly is that a lot of these people don't actually have the tools and the knowledge of how to activate necessarily on our platforms in the same way as you might be able to if you're marching in a parade or showing up with some flags and showing your solidarity and, 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 and all those things. So what we did on February, no, sorry, not February, on May the 29th, <clears throat> a short while ago, was we actually hosted like a, something we call a Friday for Good, which is something that we're sort of hoping to continue out through the year. But we actually invited LGBTQ charities to come along and sign up for sessions where you'd actually get to talk to, you know, actually on a webinar, not too dissimilar from this, you know, two or three Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp experts on how to actually activate whatever their plans were through our platforms. So, you know, having that purpose and knowing that they had a purpose, we wanted to actually, again, show allyship and build community with them. We basically gave our time away for free as long as people signed up. So that consists of having workshops to tackle, you know, big themes of things, you know, like how to do fundraising, you know, how to use a donate button, maybe you want to go live, how do you, all sorts of things. And then also having one-to-one -one breakout sessions as well to make sure that people had that human connection with us and also we could just listen, you know, what are the problems that you're having, how can we help, we're here to help. <clears throat> So the reason I'm sharing this example with you all today is because the many brands involved in Pride, I think, you know, it's a huge and important time to show allyship, for the LGBT communities. But it's also, you know, I think important to recognise that the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, it was all about showing solidarity and showing a black tile for many and kind of showing up. And I think what's really important about Pride is that that moment itself shouldn't be just the end of it for brands. 
I think it's super important to have that ongoing relationship with people, you know. So if you can offer up your time, whether it be a workshop, your advice, your community, your allyship, share your resources. I think there's never been a better time to obviously do that together. And we have this saying at um, Facebook, which is, you know, we're only 1% finished, which I think is kind of supposed to be a motivational thing, but sometimes you feel like maybe I've done more than 1%. But I think it's a good way to kind of ground ourselves and saying there is so much work to be done and the best results we're going to do is by doing it together. And ultimately, I think as many people on these talks have done today, just underline the fact that, you know, diversity and inclusion is absolutely shouldn't be seen as a problem to solve. It is a business opportunity for us to grow together and evolve and do better work and be more inclusive. That's it, Sophie. Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, I just right. had my, my supermarket delivery knock at the door and open the door to a million bags. That was totally off topic, but I thought I'd be utterly honest there. Um, that was great. Thank you, Miriam. Um, am I sharing screen? I'm not a very good one at the moment. Thank you. Brilliant. Uh, that was really interesting and great to hear about the authenticness that you garnered by getting real people involved in those real issues. Next up, we have Matt Jordan. Um, so over to you, Matt, uh, to talk about neurodiversity. Thank you. Thanks, Sophia. I'm just going to uh, share this, uh, this screen with you, hopefully. You can all see that. Um, so um, for those of you that haven't heard of M6, we're a uh, global media agency and our 180 or so staff um, primarily reside in our uh, UK HQ which is based just off the top of the court road. Um, we're, we're lucky to embrace quite a unique ownership structure between um, the creative agency the AM partnership um, and media group group M uh, which means we sit under the uh, creative uh, and media um, network within WPP. Um, as you can see, we've got a pretty broad array of clients uh, ranging from EA through to Britvic um, and Total Access and so on. Um, and I guess you could, you could say one of our key USPs um, uh, has always been that we embed uh, a number of individuals uh, within our clients' offices, which means we sit shoulder to shoulder with our clients. Uh, we, we have regular FaceTime and it does mean that um, our relationships are therefore that little bit stronger and, and much more deep rooted. Uh, as you can imagine throughout COVID-19 um, and lockdown, um, the, uh, uh, the amends to, to how we work have been pretty considerable, but um, it's been uh, a successful time to date and we're, we're excited to kind of begin to uh, to come out of things as lockdown eases. Our mission statement is to be the most important place in our people's lives. Um, we know we're certainly not um, perfect by any means. Uh, there's an awful lot to do uh, in particular on um, the, the diversity and inclusion topic, but um, what I'm gonna walk you through now will give you all a good indication of um, how seriously we take the topic, what it means to us both as individuals, but also as an agency. Um, but also that um, we know change must come from us in order to make that meaningful difference uh, in the future. And um, we're very much committed to making that meaningful change. Um, we, pre-COVID, were, um, it'd be fair to say, we were blazing a bit of a trail. Um, we're one of the fastest growing media networks on the planet. Uh, we've had consistent year-on-year -year growth. Um, our headcount has increased um, every year regularly. Um, uh, we, um, We've got a new CEO who joined uh, about two months after I did, uh, and uh, we, uh, we've got a new head of people in me um, with lots of ideas and optimism and enthusiasm. Um, and um, it's, uh, it was fair to say it was an incredibly positive time. Um, then of course, COVID hit um, and uh, everything changed um, and the impact um, across the agency, much like everybody else, um, had, had been, quite considerable cue the the sort of array of zoom fatigue uh, comments and um, video calls became very much normal uh, at the same time um, the the reality of us um, trying to find whatever our normal was much like everybody else was was considerable um, things like the blurring of time people uh, struggling to to find um, 
a, a d divide between weekends and, and weekends uh, and workday, sorry. Um, living situations for people um, vary considerably, you know, to, uh, from houses with uh, five or six people sharing um, to uh, individuals that lived on their own. Uh, and then of course, childcare uh, individuals um, sort of struggling to kind of battle with, um, with how that impacted their, their working weeks. Um, mental health um, and uh, uh, physical health um, impacted alongside sleep and, and eating habits and um, it, it varied considerably. Um, the, the biggest part I think for us as an organisation was making sure that uh, we stuck close to everybody and uh, wherever support was required we gave it um, and in some cases um, we, um, we adapted things considerably to, to work with what we were in. Um, one of the biggest sort of takeouts has been our um, physical mental health. Um, this is Steve Ball, who's um, one of our, uh, our gents who works in finance. Um, he already ran a, a weekly boot camp, but um, as you can see, became a bit of an overnight celebrity. Um, his, uh, his sessions are now held right the way across uh, the agency, uh, not just in the UK, but um, he's recorded things and is now working um, across uh, New York. and. Um, Canadian offices, believe it or not. Um, the other bits and pieces we worked alongside, uh, as I say, was, was mental health and supporting our managers and individuals. Uh, this is just a bit of an example of one of the booklets we sent out to help give people reminders of um, what was important and uh, providing that support wherever it was, uh, was, it, wherever it was appropriate. Um, we also released this graphic, which um, I think it's quite a powerful one and, and working out who um, as an individual you wanted to be during the pandemic. Um, our, our sort of natural state um, originally was to be pretty anxious and, um, and really struggle to, to sort of operate um, being very fearful. But as you move through COVID and it becomes um, a little bit more normal, we, we sort of encouraged our staff to move into a learning zone and then into a growth zone. And I think that the kind of the key point of this would always be um, give up what you can't control, um, living in the present uh, and focusing on the future, making your talents available to those uh, around you, um, looking at ways to adapt and change. Uh, we're a very entrepreneurial and innovative business. And I think one of the, the big pluses to this um, pandemic was that that really, really kicked off in a big way. Uh, and then the final thing is is be empathetic, uh, looking out for people and, and focusing on on them. Um, but um, it's important to kind of think about that um, and and what the impact was um, in terms of our, our work ethic. And I think one of the major sort of pluses for us, as uh, actually you had alluded to um, in his talk, was around values and, and mission statements and. Um, our values um, often shape our thinking, um, how we interact with one another, how we pride ourselves on an inclusive uh, culture, I should say, um, even whilst we're in these remote scenarios. So um, they're there as a reminder to everyone. Um, it's not just the leadership team. Uh, and uh, we remind our clients of, of these as well. Um, we're, we're fortunate that we had um, a, a very strong sort of culture of communication in place already. Um, everything at M6 um, comes in sixes. Um, so uh, the, the one that's not mentioned on here is uh, obviously the, the assumption that one-to-one -one conversations still continue to take place, but um, we have weekly, monthly, bi-monthly, quarterly bits and pieces that stick in place. And I think that has been absolutely crucial to making sure that everybody has exactly the information they needed to be able to, um, to operate and um, throughout the whole thing, we've communicated very clearly and concisely and been very, very honest, living up to one of our, um, our values. Um, but into neurodiversity, so um, assuming um, a lot of you know what neurodiversity is, I'll, I'll just give a very, very top sort of line. Um, it's um, pretty clear that, um, well, most people are, are actually neurotyp uh, neuro, sorry, I will say that again, neurotypical, meaning that the brain functions and processes information in the way society expects, but um, an estimated people um, in the UK, one in seven, um, that's 15% of people in the UK are neurodivergent, which means the brain functions, learns and processes information differently. 
So um, neuro neurodiversity plays a huge role in our day-to-day -day agency life and has had an enormous impact on us as individuals too. Um, we've had great success in tweaking our management styles in order to safeguard the performance of some of our uh, individuals. We, um, we're very fortunate to have um, a, a wonderful um, partnership with Ambitious About Autism. Um, uh, we are now entering our, our fourth, um, or about to enter our fourth year of working with them. Um, and um, they've, you know, it'd be fair to say they've, they've had a huge impact on the organisation. Um, they've actively been involved in brainstorms, in cracking briefs, um, but most of all, um, they've challenged what in some cases has been normal um, and really getting us to think hard at why things are as they are um, when they don't need to be. Um, we, um, we're incredibly proud of our partnership um, and um, we, um, I'll talk you through the, the sort of um, process that we've had with interns um, since they've been in the business. So um, to kick off the process, we actually asked um, the, uh, the organisation um, who would like to get involved um, with, uh, with the AA um, partnership. Um, and uh, one of the major sort of areas we focused on was um, training and development. And um, to, um, to kind of really dial into um, what was going on, we, we made sure that um, everybody was, um, who was included in the training was um, uh, provided the right sort of tools and, and given the right understanding of, um, of what neurodiversity and divergence meant. Um, it meant that um, we, uh, we were able to really, really learn a lot about ourselves, um, but also as M6 is a business and how we can support those staff within the organization, uh, including making the adjustments we sought out um, right at the outset to, to be as inclusive as we possibly could. Um, outside of lockdown, simple things like um, playing music um, had uh, an enormous impact on um, our neurodivergent staff. Um, little things like that meant that um, we could make the appropriate adjustments um, and uh, the, the impact was, um, was really wonderful. Um, we are, are quite fortunate as a business that um, we're often very data and insight led um, and uh, one of the huge positives and outtakes for us in terms of the new diversity um, was that um, this sort of analytical mindset lends itself incredibly well to neurodivergent staff. Um, I wanted to, to showcase um, a couple of slides that our, uh, one of our interns this year produced as we entered into um, the deeper sort of parts of lockdown. And um, this individual took it upon herself to, um, to focus on the things that um, were important to her in making sure that she felt she was able to operate at a high level. Um, and it served as a brilliant reminder to the rest of the agency um, to, uh, to kind of keep an eye on one another um, on top of what we were already doing as a leadership team and uh, with our mental health allies and, and so on. Um, it's um, a kind of a stark reminder to us that it's often the beautiful basics that make the difference in times like this. And um, as you can imagine, the, the document was really, really warmly received. Um, so this year's intake have been particularly special for us. Um, as I said, they've, they've had a, a huge impact on the organisation, but um, one of the sort of major outtakes of this was actually forming um, a partnership with WPP and Microsoft, um, which is around educating our people um, on, uh, on the suite of tools that we use readily available to us at the moment. So in particular, Zoom being one of them um, and um, showcasing that actually those that are neurodivergent um, don't always um, conform to whatever normal is um, within our um, our environments and making appropriate adjustments um, with the technology that we're using um, is, a, is a major, major part of that. And it's hugely exciting. Uh, we're thrilled to be helping to sort of shape the future of working for our um, divergent staff in the future. Um, the, uh, the impact of COVID-19 on our neurodiverse talent has been broad and pretty wide ranging. Um, as I say, some have struggled to adapt to less process and structure, whereas others have, um, have really thrived in the comfort of their own homes where less anxiety are, are present. Um, we've also noticed a really increased level of product, productivity and output, um, which we've attributed to, um, to more dynamic working. Um, we've adapted just about every support measure that existed before lockdown into uh, to remote versions of this. And uh, we're really pleased that um, everybody has uh, adapted to um, a new way of working. Um, it's not just 
um, the guys at Ambitious About Autism that we've worked with in neurodiversity. Um, we've also worked with Ali um, in Creative Equals, but we've also worked uh, collaboratively with uh, the British Dyslexia Association and with, uh, with Grammarly. Um, it's um, a really important area of the business and um, we, um, we're really sort of blessed to, to have such a, a positive work um, force that are desperate to get involved in a lot of our uh, initiatives, in particular this one around neurodiversity. Um, I'm, I'm going to show you a little bit about our, our wellness work because, um, again, this has had to be adapted um, whilst we've been in lockdown. But um, one of the sort of key areas that our interns um, highlighted was that um, uh, having a space for wellness, whether that's for um, having time to switch off and separate yourself from, from work and have a, a, a quiet moment to meditate um, or to utilise the prayer room, what have you, it's just been really, really important. So we've um, adjusted uh, things, but this space exists in our office. Uh, it's been kitted out with a whole host of things, ranging from iPads loaded with mindfulness apps um, through to um, blinds and what have you for, for privacy. Um, it's, um, it's been a really, really positive step for us to, to house. And um, if you're able to, I implore you all to, um, to bring in one of these spaces within your own businesses. Um, and then uh, this is a poster which one of the interns designed this year and it sits in a frame in that room. Um, it's basically showcasing five different steps to meditation. Um, it's um, a, a key area for um, our interns this year um, was meditation and understanding how to, um, to separate the, the stresses and anxieties. Um, uh, I love it. And uh, it's just, a, again, another little sort of behavioral nudge that um, just because you haven't done it before doesn't mean that you, um, you can't learn. Um, so kind of key takeaways, I would say, um, for, for us um, is that um, the first is that um, everybody within a neurodiverse environment, um, it's a difference, not a deficit. So um, I think in particular, our, our staff have really kind of embraced this. Um, there's obviously a, a, an awful lot of work to be done in this area, but um, it's certainly something that has, has had a huge impact on, on the business. Secondly, um, I'd encourage you all to think about your staff and tailor your learning and development to support that neurodiversity um, uh, and try to put it candidly, a one size fits all uh, approach is, um, is pretty out of date. And then finally, um, it's, it's definitely worth having those individual conversations um, and provide the necessary support to the neurodiverse in your workforce. Um, just because you've not received feedback to say they're having difficulties doesn't mean they're not. Um, and asking the questions and, and, and feeling uncomfortable is, um, you know, all part and parcel of, of making sure you're, um, you're, you're tapping into um, to everybody who's involved in your, your workforce. Um, as I alluded to, um, uh, we're passionate about this stuff. Um, and I wanted to close with some, some lovely feedback that we've had. Um, to reiterate, though, um, we recognise that the topic of diversity and inclusion is very much an ongoing Thing. Uh, certainly not a flippant um, tokenistic attempt to, um, to satisfy statistics or to, to feel like we're making an effort. Um, it's a genuine business priority for us, um, but also um, for our sector and, and many others like it. And certainly from the, uh, the panellists we've heard from this morning, it is with them too. Um, I think um, if you genuinely want diversity, um, diversity of thought, fresh challenges for all the right reasons um, and a culture that means something to people, then diversity can be the game changer. Um, ironically, you've probably always been searching for it, but the reality is it's often within your grasp um, and doing something about it, however, is, uh, is altogether different. Um, that's personally the, the sort of meaningful change I want to see, um, but um, hopefully that's given you a little bit of insight into, um, into what we do at M6. Lovely, thank you so much, Matt. That was great um, and really great to see, especially seeing that summary that your um, employee came up with to share how, how things that would help, as you say, it would help us all to work a bit more like that. I think the work on neurodiversity is absolutely key. Thank you. Um, and finally, we have um, Sume from Media Trust. She's the CEO there, who's going to talk a little bit about um, whether COVID is a tipping point for uh, 
inequality. Um, Meet Trust, as I mentioned at the beginning, is our charity part, and I'm conscious we are a little bit over time, but please do stay on and, and hear about the Media Trust because the work that they do with, I know a lot of our members already, is brilliant. Um, they work very much with um, underprivileged communities and young children, and, and young people, sorry, young people. Sumo is going to share an overview of what Media Trust does, how media stereotypes have perpetuated mm -hmm. inequality, uh, and what our industry can do to help strengthen um, the opportunities um, to make a marginalised communities more um, prevalent and involved. So over to you, please, Sume. Great. Um, can you hear me? We can. We can. Okay. Uh, screen share. Screen share. No screen share. Three. What is happening with the screen share? Yeah, I think if you just go to present mode, we can see your screen. You can see it now? Yeah, we can see it. Brilliant. Okay, well, thank you so much, Sophia. And thank you everyone for lasting the course and staying on the call. Um, as Sophia said, I'm Sue May Thompson, CEO of Media Trust. And for those of you who don't know us, we work in partnership with the media, creative and tech industries to give charities, underrepresented communities and young people a stronger voice. And because we work with thousands of charities across the UK, we have seen firsthand the inequality that COVID has laid bare. So the good news is it definitely feels like there has been a tipping point. There's a greater consciousness about societal divisions and a greater public will to do something about this, whether it's more out of more empathy or enlightened self-interest. I mean, if you reflect on how for years the number of homeless people in the UK has been rising, but with the fear of infections spreading from the homeless to the rest of the population, in the space of a few weeks, the government managed to clear 90% of homeless people off the streets. That's incredible. People have now realised that their health, education and welfare are inextricably linked to the health, education and welfare of the poorest and most vulnerable in society. And that gap just can't continue to grow without hurting everyone. So I think we have to wait and see where this shift ultimately leads. But with COVID forcing a reset of so many policies and giving us the chance to build back better, I'd like to think we can come out of all of this, not just with solutions for the homeless, but also better wage protection for low income workers, more accessible services for the disabled, and a greater acceptance of all races and faiths. But it now feels like a moment when marginalized communities and the charities that advocate for them have an open invitation to come forward to tell their stories. At Media Trust, we know the majority of charities desperately need help to do this. And that's where we and industry support come in because we know nonprofit work isn't just done by nonprofits. So I've been CEO of Media Trust now for two years, and I'm still really excited every day by the magic of what we do. We use the power of the media to transform lives. So we help marginalized communities to challenge entrenched stereotypes and fight for more authentic media representation. We help charities with their storytelling, advocacy and campaigning, press engagement and social media. And we do this through comms and digital training for charities delivered with the help of our industry partners and by matching charities with industry volunteers. Meanwhile, our youth programs are giving thousands of young people from BAME and non-traditional backgrounds skills, access and mentoring to break into the sector because we know that talent is everywhere but opportunities are not. So our flagship programs include working with Google to provide digital skills training to charities. Our Stronger Voices program is building the comms capabilities of equality organisations across London. And we've received funding from the government to tackle the underrepresentation of disability in the news in partnership with the BBC. But let me expand on why the media industry is so critical to the work we do to tackle inequality and to help marginalised communities level up. It's because the media is too often part of the problem and therefore needs to be part of the solution. So the all pervasiveness of media in this country, the fact that advertising is so hugely aspirational, the way social media has become so embedded in our lives, 
means the media has the potential to create these massive shifts in societal attitudes and behaviours. If YouGov is right and more than 60% of the British public get their knowledge about Islam from the media, then the criticism that's often levelled at UK media for promoting negative stereotypes about Muslims is really concerning. Even critically acclaimed films and TV shows like the BBC's Brilliant Bodyguard fail the RIS test because they have Muslim characters that fit one of five stereotypical tropes, including being a terrorist or misogynistic. So the good news is we have started to see brands led by pioneers like Unilever and the brands that fell on the right side of Rebecca's marking system, embracing campaigns that are more inclusive, that recognize the world is multicultural, that are using their brand power to destigmatize everything from body shapes to periods. But there's still so much more to be done to promote a more level playing field. 20% of us have a disability, but disabled people are still largely invisible when it comes to news and advertising. And what does that do for the self-esteem of disabled people? Matt, I was so encouraged to hear what you had to say about, um, about neurodiversity and what M6 are doing, but honestly, not enough employers are as open um, and inclusive as you are when it comes to disability. So some of you will recognize the wonderful Emma Gardner here. She's managing partner of Elvis on this slide. And she was talking about her disabled daughter, Lottie, at our Reframing Disability Summit, and how there was nowhere in the media that she could see someone like her, and how that made her feel like a parent, and her worry about how that will limit Lottie's ability to achieve her full potential. And in my own home, my teen girls and I still call out, Asian! when we're watching TV and someone Asian comes on in a program or an ad. When you're used to seeing yourself reflected in the media, stop and think how much it means to someone who isn't when they see themselves reflected back, whether it's on a billboard or in a screen. It's a message that you're seen and you're represented. But I think the benefits of more representative media and advertising go even further than this. It's not just important to show people themselves and make them feel they matter. It's perhaps even more important to show people people who are different from who they are because of the power of the media to help us relate to stories that aren't our own, to walk in someone else's shoes, to go on their journey, to see life through their eyes. Media gives us a more expansive view of who we are and makes us realize that what unites us is far greater than what divides us. And if those of us involved in media and advertising want to do our bit to tackle inequality, then, as Riz Ahmed memorably said in his Channel 4 annual diversity lecture, the media industry needs to step up to help push our imagination to be as broad as our community actually is. So brands and businesses are obviously grappling right now with how they're going to behave now that we're emerging from the crisis. I really hope they're not all going to come out with ad campaigns that try and gaslight us into buying stuff we discovered we didn't need as a result of COVID, and that we'll see more purpose-driven campaigns and collaborations with the charity sector. And Media Trust is here to help forge those connections. So there are three major factors at play which vindicate our existence as an organization and are shaping our priorities going forward, all of which are about inequality. First, there's never been a more critical time for marginalized communities to tell their story COVID and Black Lives Matter have underscored how we need to do a better job of listening to the voices of people with lived experience. Secondly, the future is clearly digital and charities need to bridge the digital divide or risk getting left behind. And thirdly, youth unemployment looks set to explode and young people from disadvantaged backgrounds are likely to be the most impacted. So all of this has given an urgency to our mission at Media Trust to connect the media creative and tech sectors with charities, with underrepresented communities and young people to ensure they have a stronger voice while helping the media industry to be more responsive, responsible and representative. We know demand for our work is there. Of the 200 charities that responded to our recent survey to uncover the biggest comms challenges charities are facing due to COVID, 
98% said they're struggling with comms and how to shift services that were face-to-face -face online, how to create digital content that will cut through, and how to navigate the plethora of available platforms and apps to connect with beneficiaries, partners, volunteers, and donors. 97% of charities also said they would love pro bono or volunteer come support. And all of this, of course, isn't surprising given the lack of digital preparedness in the sector. As Sir Stephen Bubb, Director of Charity Futures, wrote in the Times last month, the crisis has highlighted how many charities live hand to mouth and the neglect of IT systems and the failure to train staff and managers better damages the cause and hampers results. So at Meta Trust, we're busy galvanizing media, creative and tech industry support for charities. And there are loads of ways that IAB members can get involved. Specifically, we've launched a series of free weekly webinars delivered by industry partners to help charities. So our first webinar with Twitter attracted more than 300 signups in the space of an hour and provided platform updates, audience insights and content ideas to enhance how charities are using Twitter. We've since had a webinar from Snap on reaching Gen Z, Gen Z audiences. And last week, we had a BBH team presenting on creating content for social that can compete with cats. So if anyone listening can offer a masterclass on any aspect of digital comms or share materials for our free online resources hub, which charities can access anytime, any place at their own pace, we would love to hear from you. We've also got an online matching platform where charities can post their needs for expert comms support and media and creative industry volunteers can find opportunities to give back that align with their interests, skills and availability. So um, we've seen a massive spike in volunteers signing up, which is fantastic. Charities we've helped include Ealing Mencap, who found a volunteer to work on their Look I Can campaign and help them develop digital resources for people with learning disabilities to use at home. Please get in touch to find out more about team-based or individual volunteering opportunities. And if you can, help us encourage colleagues, particularly anyone who's on furlough or not working for the time being to volunteer. That would be amazing. Lastly, with youth unemployment looking set to explode, please consider getting involved in our youth programmes, like our Creativity Works 10-week multimedia boot camp for disadvantaged young Londoners. This is usually del delivered face-to-face -face in classroom settings, and we take our young people to visit our media industry partners so they can see what it's like to work at Adam and Eve, Amazon, Edelman, Facebook, Twitter, and so on. When lockdown was announced, we were on day two of our latest 10-week programme cycle but we didn't throw in the towel. We persevered and managed to pivot and deliver the whole program successfully online. And we're now working with the Mayor's Fund for London on a new project to share the lockdown stories of young people in London and New York. So lockdown and COVID does have its silver linings. Thanks to COVID forcing us to innovate, we're now much more confident in our ability to deliver engaging training and to set and judge practical challenges online. Our, new, our next Creativity Work season starts on September 14th with our new cohort. You can offer virtual company visits, careers talks or mentoring for our young people. We would love to hear from you. So in closing, the pandemic is giving us an opportunity to build back better, to build back a more equal society. It's also given us a glimpse of the future where if we can better align digital with social impact, charities can do so much more good than they already are. So at Media Trust, we would just really love your help to make this a reality. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you, Sumay. That was great and fantastic to know how we can all get involved and help because I think a lot of people do want to do something um, supporting the industry. Obviously, with everything going on, this is a fantastic way. And speaking from experience, Creativity Works is just a fantastic course. I mean, I haven't been on it, but I have um, attended one of the sessions and it's phenomenal and it's great what it does with the individuals that go on those courses. Uh, really, that brings us, thank you so much to all our speakers, to the end of today's um, webinar. Thank you to Rebecca, Ali, Ewan, Miriam, Matt and Sue May. Uh, if anyone has any questions, you can just pop them on the Q&A now and we can obviously get answers responded. Um, if, if, if not now, then after the session. Thank you to Unruly as sponsors for today and thank you all for attending. It's been great and I think we've all learnt and uh, reflected a lot. Thank you.